Hi everyone, it's Mark Steiner and welcome here to The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. Today we're going to wrestle with what's happening underneath the issues we face here in the United States of America. We're going to look at them through the lens of race, of class, our history, how history defines where we are now and what that means for our planning for the future. And I can think of no better person to do that with than somebody I've talked with, interviewed numerous times over the years, Bill Fletcher Jr., who's a longtime union activist and leader who has spoken and written deeply about the intersection of race, class, and political economic change in our history. He's been a leader here at the AFL-CIO and the Service Employees International Union, and most recently was president of the Trans-Africa Forum. His latest book is Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Trade Unions. And Bill, good to see you. Welcome back. The Mark Steiner great, show. great to be here. And this Mark Steiner show, yes, new iterations. Good That's to have right. you here. It is. It is. Yeah. So, you know, I as I look at this, as I look at what we face here with this Trump administration, there's so many places to start this, but let me begin here. Um, historically, whether, and you've talked about this before and written about this, whether we are looking at the history of Hitler in Germany or Mussolini in Italy or a populist movement here in the 90s or what happened in the United States during the 60s at the tail end of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. We've seen progressive, we, we've seen these situations where we thought that the progressive world, the socialist world, was on the cusp of actual power building a new kind of democracy. But every time it didn't happen. Now, what is history telling us about where we are? It's telling us that uh, the outcome is never certain. That's what it's telling us, that, that history does not move in a linear fashion. See, the mistake that, that many of us make uh, is that we assume that there's this great line. You know, to, to borrow from King's reference, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, right? Well, rhetorically, that's nice, but it's not clear that that's true, that what you see throughout history are all kinds of zigs and zags, some incredible disasters, some incredible accomplishments. And, and therefore, we can't take anything for granted. One of the mistakes that I think that our generation made in the end of the 60s, and particularly in the 70s, was assuming that what had been won was secure. That, that yes, there might be a little black, backsliding, but that basically we had won and place the United States in a different uh, location. And we missed the boat. We did not understand the nefarious forces on the right that never accepted the victories of the 60s and early 70s and were determined to turn the clock back. We became complacent. That's my principal lesson. So if you look at our history, let me take a couple of moments in history and talk about where they might fit into today's mm -hmm. world, right? I've been saying this a lot, and, and you might disagree with, with the overall framing of this, but let me try it. That, you know, the, the history is a constant force of different people's movements fighting for a, whatever the form of justice that is. Uh, that takes place and pushing hard, but then there's right. always this equal <clears throat> force, if not right. stronger force, that pushes back. Mm -hmm. So we had the Civil War right. in the 1860s. Reconstruction came. Uh, something that I think we need to spend a great deal more time dis discussing and studying is what happened in Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. It was a time, to, for me anyway, of when my analysis of uh, that it was one of the greatest moments of democracy, unfolding democracy in the history of the United States mm -hmm. in the South, that was crushed by the redemptive, redemptive movement, where it was crushed by Washington, D.C., it was crushed by Rutherford B. Hayes to make a deal to become president of the United States, that not only led in 1870 to the end of Reconstruction, but the opening of terror against the black world in a major way. So if you look at that, I mean, that was like turning everything that was fought for, people bled for, literally, and died on its head. So, I mean, what does that say about the forces that we contend with and what that says about now, if it does say something about now. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's, let's look at the historical quandary. Um, the Civil War was fought over basically two issues, slavery and free trade. 
and the it's a juxtaposition for today's world. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The Confederate forces were proponents of free trade, and that put them in a collision course with northern industrial capitalism. Because what the southern plantocracy wanted was access to cheap goods from uh, England, cheap and, and quality goods. And England wanted cotton. Now, in order to develop industry in the northern part of the United States, you needed to protect the industry from the competition from other countries that could produce cheaper. So the northern industrial capitalists pushed for tariffs. And they said, we've got to have protection, otherwise there will be no northern industry. We will be subservient to Britain and France. And so there was this clash. So you have that and slavery that were, that were bringing us towards an irreconcilable challenge. And thus we had the Civil War. The Northern Industrial Capitalists were never interested in the, the true emancipation of the African. They were interested in ending slavery, in, in, in subordinating the Southern plantocracy, and developing Northern capital. So for a certain period of time, there was a wing of the Republicans that were the you know, radical, radical Republicans, right? Right, right, who right. were interested in advancing a process of democratization. So you're absolutely right. It was an unusual period in U.S. history where there were tremendous, uh, tremendous advances, uh, public education, uh, political power for the poor and for the black. But here's the other thing that I started thinking about, Mark. While this is all going on, Native Americans were being vanquished as the settler state, which was called the United States, was pushing further west. So this leads to an interesting question. Even if Reconstruction had worked, what about the Native American? Or another way of putting it was, was the fact that while Reconstruction was underway, that there was a genocidal war against Native Americans, part of what undermined Reconstruction. So I think we have to think about Wait, this. Let me, let me stop you. Yeah. Let me just step back one second. Okay. What you just said, there, the one, before we go back to some of the other nuances and of, uh, for history and now, right. what you just said, mm -hmm. the, the, the relationship between the genocide against and stealing of the land from Native people, the indigenous people of this country, and reconstruction and liberation of black people. So, right. what, how do you? So, what are the contradictions you're analyzing here? There, that the deep-seated racism that was contained not only in slavery but also racism and racist oppression that was contained not only in slavery but in the genocide against the Native Americans. I don't think could have been compartmentalized. In other words, I'm now of the opinion that you could not have had a successful reconstruction while Native Americans were being annihilated. That, that the, the evils, the snakes that were unleashed with the annihilation of Native Americans, with the subjugation of what had been Northern Mexico, right? Because it, it's, not just the, the, it's not just the annihilation of Native Americans, but it was also the subordination of northern Mexico that takes place formally in 1848, but carries on to this day, you could not compartmentalize the South and say there will be democracy, democracy in the South while we're annihilating the Native Americans, while we're subordinating the Mexican Americans, while we're excluding the Chinese. It's all of a package. And that package is the racist settler state that comes to be known as the United States of America. So, a couple of things here. I mean, we, let me just clarify. When we talk about northern Mexico, I think we're talking about Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, Nevada. Nevada. That's right. Colorado. That's northern that's Mexico. Right, that's right. Clear, let's be clear what northern Mexico is. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> exactly. So, um, in that context, you also had a time then when uh, 
the complexity of race and class in this country, you had a time when some of the five civilized tribes, as they were called, mm -hmm. the Confederation of Southern uh, Native Tribes, na Native Nations, Cherokees, Greeks, Crees, Seminole, um, Choctaw, mm -hmm. um, many of them ha were slaveholders. That's right. Um, also, black folks were integrated into those societies, which was part of the Seminole War against the United Absolutely. States. Absolutely. was about black freedom liberation as That's well right. as Native liberation. Exactly. But then you also had liberated black men in the U.S. Army who became the, 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 Buffalo the storied Buffalo soldiers right. to fight Native people in the West That's right. and defeat them for the United States government. So all those contradictions were at work at one time. That's right. Right? Exactly. What you didn't have... You didn't have a rainbow coalition. Right. <laughs> right? That's what you didn't right. have. Right. And and you're absolutely right that the there were these native tribes that believed that they had accomplished peace in their time, that they had proven themselves to be civilized, up to and including in some cases, as you noted, slavery, slaveholding. Uh, they they were devastated when Andrew Jackson began his wars against them and forcing their expulsion to uh, Oklahoma. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't conceive of it. In, in some ways, it was analogous to German Jews who could not, who simply could not accept that this was happening given the high culture of Germany. We're Germans. Right, exactly. <laughs> who right, had served right. proudly in World War I. <laughs> Right, right, I might add, right, and and thought of themselves as patriots, and now all of a sudden the world is being upended, and they're being told that they're no longer Germans. Well, in a in a hundred years earlier, that's in essence what happened to those civilized tribes. Now, um, for African Americans, you're right that after the Reconstruction, uh, the the defeat of Reconstruction and towards the tail end. You had African-American veterans from the Civil War that went west. There was, the, there was a, an immigration movement, emigration movement, that was called the Exoduses, right? That was mainly people from Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas that started moving to Missouri, Kansas, and further west. Uh, my wife's family is, are descendants of... Oh, the Exoduses. Ab absolutely. Um, the, but there was this... What you saw with the Buffalo Soldiers is something that you've seen in subsequent wars where African Americans are trying to prove themselves to be real Americans, to be true patriots, and to lay them their lives on the line. So you see that with the Buffalo Soldiers. You see that in the Spanish-American War. You see that in the Filipino-American War, although there was a little twist there when African Americans started to defect. Um, you see that in World War I, this, this desire to prove themselves, to prove themselves to be patriots. And each time, we get slapped in the face. So if you think about that in terms of where we are now yeah. in this country, now, let me start this way. Which is, this, isn't, this is a total aside that I have no data on but I'm watching it and I'm gonna find the data. Okay. Which is that you look, let's say, we're, we're taping in Baltimore. In Baltimore, one of the largest occupations in the city um, are security forces, mm -hmm. private and public. Um, and that's just a reality. That's right. The vast majority of the private security forces in this city are being made up of poor working class black people. Mm -hmm. That's who's yeah. men's and women's the security forces, right. with or without weapons. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that in, this, in the context of all the larger question. So here we have the, the, the year 2000 and the struggle on racism has intensified around Black Lives Matter, police killings being exposed, the depth of racism in America, the day-to-day -day consequences of being black in America being exposed because of technology, many of the reasons being exposed and creating a, a different movement and you have our first black president, and then you have this reactionary white president coming in on the tails of that because we had a black president mm -hmm. in some respects. That's why right, we, right. That, this happened, right? And we're facing something you talked about earlier that also happened during the Civil War and Reconstruction, which has to do with this battle over um, fair trade, 
free trade and tariffs mm -hmm. and what they all mean. Right. So, so there's a lot, I don't intend to get into all that with this one question, sure. but these overarching pieces we're facing now uh, have their mirrored historical reflection in the 19th century. Oh, absolutely. Right? So what does that, how does that, what does that teach us? If anything? Um, well, I think that there's a variety of different lessons, but I want to pick up on the specific thing that you were raising about the security guards. Yeah, sure. Um, because what that speaks to more than anything else is the impact that neoliberal globalization, the reorganization of global capitalism, has had on black workers. So when you go back to the 19th century, the um, African Americans going into the military uh, was both an issue of survival, needing jobs, but also, particularly during times of war, to prove themselves. There would be, there would be these bandwagons of let us show America, meaning white America, that we are as dedicated as they are. And during the Civil War, fighting for their own liberation. Well, that was a very right. particular thing, right? right yeah, that right. was, that was right. in essence, an uprising. Right. Um, but after that... Right, okay. Okay. Right. Um, what we see with security guards is something very different. We're, we're, we're looking at a process by which the black working class, the black worker, has been subject to, subjected to um, tremendous uh, losses over the last 40 years. See, this is one of the things that really bothers me, Mark, about the arguments that were made in support, uh, in justifying white workers that supported Trump. They said, well, you know, uh, things have been rough, uh, the American dream is disappearing. Their living standard is declining. All of which is true for the working class as a whole. But what's really important is that all of these symptoms were things that we started to see facing black workers and many Latino workers beginning in the late 50s and the early 1960s. With the introduction of suburbanization and automation and the transformation of the cities, the kinds of jobs that had been available, particularly to white immigrants, uh, unskilled and semi-skilled jobs, started to evaporate. You started to see the relocation of industry, a process that starts in the late 50s, but really catches fire in the 1970s. And when it catches fire, there's a devastation of many cities that had been uh, centers of industry and manufacturing. You know, so you have early on crises hitting cities like East St. Louis, Camden, New Jersey. But then you start to see the crisis spread to Youngstown, Ohio, Chicago, Flint, Detroit, et cetera, et cetera. Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. <clears throat> and the jobs that had been unionized, the jobs that had been value producing, I mean that economically, the jobs through which people could buy homes start to evaporate. And the cities start holing out. You, you, you start to see not the disappearance, or you, you're not seeing the abandonment of the cities by the black so-called middle class. The so-called middle class were black workers that had serious income-producing jobs. Those jobs start disappearing. And, and, and so you start to see these sinkholes that are developing in city after city, and there are no jobs except for security jobs, except for service jobs. Um, and, and, and then some other jobs that are filled largely by immigrants from Latin America and Asia that are brought in. So it's different than what happened in the 19th century when there was a tremendous demand for black labor. Um, there was a tremendous demand for black labor in the fields, <clears throat> tremendous demand for black labor that you see in World War I when immigration from Europe was cut off. And all of a sudden, all of these industries are looking for black labor. We're facing a different kind of crisis. Final point, which is that we are the canary in the coal mine. So all of these things that, that led to white workers talking about how their living standard was collapsing, <clears throat> we've been experiencing this. But it was never treated as a crisis, just like opioid. We suffer the opioid. It's not a crisis.
Miss Ann in South Southern Indiana dies of it, and now <coughs> we have a crisis. So, uh, one of the things I think about with all this is, you know, we always hear the adage that we need to learn from history. Yes. So let's play with that for a minute. Okay. So you outlined what we face now, and I was trying to outline a bit of what happened in our history before that, as you, and then you really fleshed that out even more for us. So, okay, that's our history. So what do we learn from that? I mean, okay. as we think about, in the next segment of our show, going into questions of where we are, where we go from here, yeah. what do we learn from the fact that okay. the, it, it, all the things we've just spoken about, let me throw in there and also add, because you've spoken about this before as well, which is the 1890s. That's right. Good. With the rise of populism movement that was destroyed and uh, for yeah. complex reasons of the leadership going to the Democratic Party, other reasons as well. That was also the time when legal segregation was implemented in a major way across this country. And that terror against black folks, especially in the South, right. became daily routine. Okay. So, 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 we, so, and we're in many ways in similar understanding things here in the 21st century. So what, what does that teach us about where we are now in terms of what it means for us? So it's our history. So what? What does that tell us where, where we should go? It, it's critical. So let's go back then, 18, the 1800s. Um, Reconstruction is defeated in 1876. Right. The federal troops get pulled out of the South in 1877. So from that point up until the 1890s, there's a slow-moving regression with the undermining of black and poor people's power in the South. Sounds like 2018. That's right, right. <laughs> um, you, actually could, you could actually predate it um, in a funny way. But yeah, there's a slow moving. It doesn't happen all at once. The withdrawal of federal troops is not like the next day everything flipped. It's slow moving and uh, systematically blacks are losing political power. You don't see poor people generally. But then what happens is there's the rise of what you referred to, this populist movement. Now, it's important for your listeners to be clear that populism is a generic term that means the people against an elite. There can be left-wing forms of populism and it can be right-wing forms of populism. Right. In the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s, there develops what was generally a progressive populist movement, which was farmers and workers that started to revolt against what was called at the time the Gilded Age, an age much like ours, where wealth was running wild. And, and this movement emerges to challenge the Gilded Age. Um, and it starts to win. It starts to win local offices and ultimately forms a political party called the Populist Party. Um, but then what happens? Well, a couple of things happen, but the most important thing that happens is the introduction of race. That the populist movement runs up on the rocks of race and it splinters because the populist movement, by and large, it included uh, large numbers of African American and white poor, and in the Southwest, uh, 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 Mexicano, Chicano poor. Um, they were actually far, white and black farmers in the South actually united in certain unite. points. That's in, right, in this absolutely. Right. But mm -hmm. they don't tackle the question of race. They don't tackle the erosion of what was happening and this slow-moving but development process towards Jim Crow segregation. And the white elite in the South understands and is very fearful of this, Mark. They're very fearful that they're going to lose political power to the poor. And they splinter the populist movement with a direct appeal to white supremacy. And they peel off a segment of the white leadership of the populist movement to move in a right-wing conservative populist direction that argues that Ultimately, a deal can be cut with the white elite, but they have to accept the notion of white supremacy. So the movement shatters. The other factor that happens was that under the leadership of William Jennings Bryan, the populist movement decide that they can make peace with the Democratic Party. And so they move in there, and by moving into the Democratic Party of the first decade of the 1900s, you're moving into a white supremacist party. 
So it erodes. So what's the, what are the lessons? There's multiple lessons, but the one lesson that I would argue is that you can't avoid race. That, that the appeals to so-called race-neutral populism always fail, always fail. And I think that when we look at the Bernie Sanders campaign, mm. that is where you see this problem reemerge with an attempt that Sanders, with all due respect, and I was a Sanders supporter, let's be clear, right. right? But there's a tendency within his campaigns and his politics to try to find a race-neutral approach to the unification of working people. And the problem is there is not one. You can't avoid race. Race is the tripwire of U.S. politics. You can't avoid it. You have to cut the wire. And every attempt at that, whether through the populist movement, whether through uh, various efforts that took place in the trade union movement, they fail. So we're sitting here talking with Bill Fletcher, Jr., who has been a union activist most of his life in the AFL-CIO and the SEIU, uh, noted author, writer, lecturer, a fighter for social justice and against racism for a world class movement in this country and more. Uh, and where he left us off here, we're going to pick up with in our next se segment with Bill Fletcher uh, as we examine what does it mean, where are we now, and where do we go from here in this 21st century? Bill, it's always great to have you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And thank you all for viewing this right here on The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. Stay tuned for the next segment coming up in about a week. Don't go away.